What sort of high-tech kit do you think you'd need to detect nuclear quantum effects? Tunneling microscopes or tricorders, maybe? <laughs> nah, you need a tongue. Seriously, that's all you need to detect nuclear quantum effects. You can taste them. And not in some new age, techno babble, word soup, Deepak Chopra kind of way. That everything that we call matter comes from something that is not material. That the essential stuff of the universe is non-stuff. Call it what you will. Science also tells us that this is a field of non-locality, where everything is correlated with everything else. Local correlation, everything is connected to everything else that there's hidden creativity, there are quantum leaps of creativity, that there's something called the observer effect, where intention orchestrates space-time events. Understand that you have within you the resources to intuitively grasp this mystery. Or alternatively, you can just taste them. Taste? You know, kind of sweet-ish, maybe? <laughs> but not only that, I'm going to show you how mice taste it differently than you do. In fact, it's not really so much that you can um, taste quantum nuclear effects, you can taste the absence of quantum nuclear effects. And if that doesn't sound like it makes any sense at all, trust me, by the end of this video, it will make perfect sense. And who knows, maybe somewhere along the way, we're going to end up correcting the odd uh, Nobel Prize winner or something. So let's start off with something um, Monday, something that doesn't really taste of anything really, water regular water. Now, light water, regular water makes up some 70% of your body and it consists of two light hydrogen atoms, which are essentially protons, and an oxygen atom. And yeah, this does mean that by nuclei, you are mostly hydrogen. Conveniently, the most abundant element in the universe. But if you add a neutron to that hydrogen atom, it becomes deuterium. And it's still water, it has virtually identical chemical properties to water. Just so we're clear what we're all on about, that is regular water. And in this one, I'm going to put some heavy water, some deuterium oxide. So it's about a dollar a gram here, so 20 mils, that's about a shot or something. Well, that's about $20-ish. Now, there are some differences between these two, but in order to understand those, we're going to have to take a look at this on the atomistic length scale. So this is what your water molecule looks like. It's positively charged nuclei that contain virtually all of the mass of the molecule, but of course are so tiny that if I would plot them up on the accurate scale here, they wouldn't even be a single pixel. Then there are the electrons, which are clouds that hold these nuclei together. And those we're representing here by bonds. But, you know, really these electron clouds are more spherical in nature, but we'll come to that in a second. So at the moment we've just got one water molecule here, but what if we would put it into a drop of water molecules? So this is now actually a molecular dynamic simulation of water. It's just a single frame at the moment, but it does give you a feel for how these things behave. And this one is actually in air. So you can immediately see about the factor of a thousand difference between the density of air and the density of water. And I can also move this over to being a more space filling representation. If I go to Van der Waals, this is now more what the electron clouds actually look like. So if I now uh, play the simulation, you will see how these things actually behave. And all the dimensions to this are about right uh, in terms of how fast the air molecules are moving, how fast the water molecules are moving, and so forth. So most of the air is nitrogen. Those are the blue ones. You've got about 20% of the air is oxygen. Those are the red ones. And this is a little drop of water. And as you see, it's strongly held together by hydrogen bonds. And it's a pretty dynamic structure. So what would this look like if I were to substitute H2O for D2O. Okay, now we have exactly the same simulation, apart from I've now substituted the hydrogens here for deuterium. So, as you can see, the structure of the water is almost identical. To the visual eye, the structure of the water is identical. And this is an important feature of chemistry, is that it's mostly dictated by the electrostatics. And of course, because the charge on a hydrogen and the charge on the deuterium are exactly the same, 
and the number of electrons in the molecule are exactly the same. You expect these things to be exactly the same. The nearest analogy I can give you is it's like that experiment on the moon where you drop a feather and a hammer and they fall at the same speed. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. And you expect a similar thing on an atomistic level that the thermodynamics are not affected by the mass of the molecule. The structure you expect to be exactly the same. The kinetics, of course, will be different because the D2O molecule weighs more than the H2O molecule. And you can sort of see this in that one moves slightly quicker than the other. But in terms of structure, you expect H2O and D2O to be the same. But now let's say I'd forgotten which one was which. How could I tell the difference between the two? So by far the simplest way to do it is just to measure the density. So what you do is you take a fixed volume, which I can do very accurately in these Hamilton syringes. I can actually do these to about one part in a thousand. Um, and I just weigh it. And because the structure of the water is the same for both, uh, the deuterium weighs a little bit more than the hydrogen, what we should find is the density of this guy is about 10% higher. Okay, so the empty syringe weighs zero. Let's get one mil of water in there. So water should weigh almost exactly one gram per milliliter. That, by my reckoning, is about one mil. Let's see what that weighs on the balance. And that's almost spot on for the density of water. And when I say pretty close, actual density of water is about 0.997 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, that for me makes uh, almost exactly one mil. So what does one mil of D2O weigh? One point one oh five six, which is again almost exactly right. So the expectation is that heavy water is going to be structurally identical to light water, you know, because thermodynamics, but the kinetics are going to be different with the light water being significantly more uh, jiggly than heavy water. And at that, congratulations, your knowledge of water has now surpassed that of most people at universities. So, uh, what does it taste like? Now, that is a question to make every safety officer swoon. It's just not a question that a sensible chemist should be asking. It's virtual heresy in a chemistry lab to say, what do these things actually taste like? Now, it turns out I've been making aqueous solutions from heavy water for about a decade now because the neutron scattering technique that I use requires very precisely made D2O solutions. So it was that one of these times I took some young, reckless and inexperienced apprentice on the experiment to get some experience with neutron scattering. And I want to stress this. Without his spark of originality, none of this work would have happened. And he pops the blasphemous question. What does D2O taste like? Like I said, this is basically an unthinkable question in a modern chemistry lab. So here's a nice example. D2O, do not breathe vapor. In case of contact with eyes, rinse immediately with plenty of water. Seek medical advice, wear suitable protective clothing, gloves, blah, blah, blah. This is your typical sort of um, irritant D2O, 99.92 atom percent deuterium. The other bottles, eh, they're not quite so heavy on the warning labels. Uh, but then you start thinking about it. Uh, does that actually make sense? I mean, here we are making some of the most precise solutions using some of the purest D2O on the planet. And you can check out the toxicity of D2O and it's incredibly non-toxic. You have to replace something like 70% of the water in your body with D2O for it to become fatal. Now, not only would that be a massive endurance exercise, that would take you probably over a week. It would also be crazy expensive in that mid-range D2O costs about $1,000 per kilo. You know, you're looking at fifty dollars to $100,000 
to get that much D2O. Indeed, your body naturally contains some deuterium. About one nucleus in 10,000 in your body is deuterium. Such that if we were all stuck together to make D2O, it would make enough D2O to about fill your little finger. There are even papers out there that suggest that the threshold for any noticeable effect in humans is 100 grams or so. So, sure, why not? What does it taste like? You know, just a single drop on the tip of the tongue. Now, at this point, there'll be a lot of people out there saying, hang on, this must all be known. I mean, surely someone must have tried this before. And you're just repeating the experiments of greater men here. Well, yeah, kind of. It turns out that the taste of D2O was first investigated in 1935 by a guy called Harold Uri. And yes, that is the same Uri who discovered deuterium and got a Nobel Prize for it. And he wrote in Science Magazine, One of us kept each sample in his mouth for a short time to make sure of its taste and then spat it out. The other repeated the procedure but swallowed the water. Neither of us could detect the slightest difference between the taste of ordinary distilled water and the taste of pure heavy water. Well, uh, he's the guy who discovered deuterium and he got a Nobel Prize. I wonder what it tastes like um, now. And the answer comes back. It's kind of sweet. And within about a week of me and this other guy trying it, about three other of my colleagues had tried it. And within two weeks, everyone in the lab had tried it. All with the same results. It's kind of sweet. And beyond that, I got enough data to get some ballpark statistics. In the region of 90 to 95% of people tasted a sweet, with roughly 5% being fairly insensitive to it, and 5% really not tasting it at all. So for me, I wanted to get an estimate of how sweet d 2 actually was. Now, I did a load of experiments on myself on this and came to the conclusion that it was about equal to a, a 1% sugar solution. But hey, <laughs> you don't trust yourself as a benchmark in things like this, so I needed to do it on other people. So I prepared five sugar solutions varying from 0 to 2% of sugar, and I got people to taste them and rank them from least sweet to most sweet. And this is what you get. So if people were perfect at ordering these from least sweet to most sweet, you'd get a straight line going from bottom left to top right. So you see from one person to another, there's actually quite a lot of spread here. And the heavy line in the middle is the average of all of them. So people on average can, can rank things about this sweet. And also while I was giving people these five sugar solutions to rank blind, I put a sample of D2O in there also blind. And it turns out that I'm not a freak. And for other people, D2O was about equivalent to a 1% sugar solution. Now, at that point, I'm a happy boy, right? Because I, wow, that's so cool. D2O tastes sweet, reproducibly sweet. And then you think about it, and it's sounds like, hang on, isn't D2O meant to be structurally the same as H2O? So why does it taste sweet? Shouldn't it taste exactly the same as H2O? And why the hell does it taste sweet anyway? I mean, why not salty or bitter or sour or something? Well, the most obvious suggestion is it's not as pure as it says it is. We all know that small impurities in water can give it a, a taste, an after flavor. You know, small amounts of detergent, that sort of thing. So maybe it's some minor impurity here that's giving it the taste. Uh, yeah, I know. Who would have thought the guy who makes busting videos would turn out to be so um, uh, skeptical? So maybe the most obvious thing would be to get some D2O from different sources, ideally from different ages. Now, fortunately, I've been doing the neutron scattering thing for about 20-ish years now. So I actually had several old bottles of D2O from different sources from different ages. And they all tasted sweet. Okay, this is getting a little more convincing. Maybe we're looking at a real phenomena here. But then you start thinking, hang on, no, 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 wait, wait a second here. What if it's some generic thing about the way that they produce their D2O? Well, only one way to be certain. You make yourself a single piece glass apparatus. You wash it out with the purest water you have. You dry it under vacuum. Then you heat it up under vacuum to about 300 degrees Celsius to ensure that any organics in the apparatus have been turned to gas. 
then you distill your water in that. And if you think this is some fly-by-night video put together in less than a week or something, not quite in this case. The first record that I have of distilling heavy water goes back to 2015. This video, the one you're currently watching, has been at least five years in the making. Uh, this was back before our research group even had a chemistry lab. And all the science kit that you've been looking at here, which was purchased with the donations that I got to this channel off YouTube, was instrumental in making this work possible. So if you've donated to this channel in the last five or so years, you very directly contributed to this research. And sure, in science, no one really trusts in your word that this is gonna be good stuff. So we had one of the best mass spectroscopists in the department take a look at it. And you'll be shocked to find out that, yeah, these were some top grade pure water. So, what does the D2O taste like after you've done this very elaborate purification process on it? Well, it still tastes kind of sweet. At that point, it's like, yeah, this is actually getting pretty convincing. But why sweet? Well, we know some things about how taste works. So you have these taste receptors on your tongue, and those have got to be triggered, and then they've got to fire a nerve that tells your brain that what you just put in your mouth was sweet. So it's possible that heavy water is messing with the receptor or the nerve. But the bizarre thing here is you can't have evolved a taste receptor for D2O because it is not naturally occurring. No, well, not in any real sense on planet Earth. Well, like I was saying earlier, one of the fundamental assumptions of this neutron scattering technique that I've been using for the last 20 or so years is that light water and heavy water are isomorphic. Yeah, and by observation, that seemed to be a pretty robust observation. You know, the, the structure of H2O and D2O are virtually identical, with the only real difference being that D2O is slightly denser. Slightly denser. Ha! Huh. Maybe it's the extra weight of the molecule that's somehow messing with your taste here. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Natural abundance water consists of the natural abundance isotopes, which is basically... All of the hydrogen that you get is hydrogen, 1H, and all of the oxygen that you get is 16O. So the mass of the regular water is about 80. With D2O, of course, you get the natural abundance oxygen again, that's mass, 16, but now you've got two deuteriums there instead of two proteums. So the mass of D2O is about 20 atomic mass units. Ah, but there's a rare isotope of oxygen, oxygen 18. It's rare, which means it's expensive, but if we could get oxygen 18 H2O, what would that taste like? Because that would have an atomic mass of 20 as well. Would that taste sweet? Well, the experiment's easy enough to do. All you could do is put a few drops on your tongue and work out if it tastes sweet or not. There's just one teensy downside. That's our heavy water, our D2O, which is a um, you know, dollar a gram thousand dollars a kilo about the same price as silver and that for reference is a kilo of silver obviously silver is a degree more dense than water this is our oxygen 18 water if we can play, there we go. oxygen 18 water that's one gram and for reference that's one gram of gold and a gram of gold is about fifty dollars this is about $500 of oxygen 18 water. And you want to drink it? Now, for one, Pavel Youngwood, my friend and long-term partner in crime, found that such an interesting question that he was the one willing to blow over $1,000 to see what it tasted like. And when I say long-term partner in crime, We've worked together going all the way back to why sodium explodes in water, ammonium microjets, solvated electron, all that kind of stuff. Which, seeing as on paper, he runs a computational chemistry research group, and I'm just some guy who works in that group, it's actually not a bad list. And yet, i got to say a big thank you to that research group too for um, the services of their taste buds. Now, by the time I got around to doing these experiments, I've just done one or two experiments like this, but 
hundreds, uh, about half of those on myself trying to work out the best way to do these things. And I'd worked out some really quite important things about this taste test. The first is the best way to recognize the sweet taste of D2O is a few drops on the tip of the tongue. Which means even with just one milliliter, you can actually test quite a lot of people. The second is the sweet taste of D2O can linger in the mouth for an extended period of time, minutes, that sort of thing. And it's not so easily washed out. So randomized blind tests weren't necessarily the way to go here. Well, I knew that, but none of the people I tested needed to know that. So as far as they were concerned, these were three randomized samples. In reality, I only ever randomized the first two, the oxygen 18 and the pure distilled regular water. The D2O was always last. Uh, can you rinse the stone? Shot on the water? Shot on the water. Okay, you ready? That's good. Three drops again. One, two, three. You good? And I have to salute my colleagues here for the um, audaciousness of letting me stick a uh, hypodermic needle full of a blank liquid into their mouth. Oh, and one, two, three, gotcha. The first two, I would say, the first one was the 
was more spicy, but not really much of a difference. Just slightly more spicy. Okay. And I should also mention in passing that I got a real close up look at a lot of people's tongues while doing this, and they vary hugely from person to person. One, two, three. Um, this is number one. Okay. And you rinse. Ten times more expensive than cobble. Okay. <laughs> you just drank about thirty euros. Thirty euros, three drops, thirty euros. Come on. Ah, well, it tastes the same. Yeah. Maybe. Well, this tastes like water. This one, I wasn't sure, yeah. but this one's definitely. Sweet. Okay. Now, at that point, there's a lot of happy faces around because this can only seriously mean one thing: quantum nuclear effects. You are tasting quantum nuclear effect and that is so awesome now at this point i've really got to give a tip of the hat to cody's lab who back in 2016 and 2017 did videos where he tasted d2 and found that it tasted sweet and oxygen 18 h2o and found that it didn't taste sweet nailing the results oh yeah heavy water is is definitely sweet it's it's like the uh, oxygen 18 water, you know, it, it might be a little bit sweet, but the heavy water, it's obvious. So there's definitely a lot more research that could be done here. And I'm frankly surprised it hasn't been done. Uh, doing a Google search on this, I find very conflicting results. Yeah, that's also some cute foreshadowing in that we'd actually be doing this work for a couple of years at this point. So where does the story go next? Well, we'll find out if mice taste D2O as sweet in a second. But first, sweetness inhibitors. And pretty much do what they say on the box. And they stick to your sweet receptors and stop them from reacting to sweet things. Now, you might be wondering, what the hell would someone want a sweetness inhibitor for? Well, it turns out they use them quite a lot in food science. Yeah, if you've got something that is disgustingly sweet, like, say, for instance, jam, which maybe needs to be legitimately sweet to stop it from rotting or something. But you don't want it to taste unbearably sweet. You put sweetness inhibitors into it. Yeah, maybe not the most healthy thing, but whatever. That's what they're used for. And I can tell you, having actually done these experiments myself, that it is so freaky that you get a, a single sugar solution and you split it into two and you add a little bit of sweetness inhibitor to one of them and one of these solutions tastes sweet, and the other one doesn't taste sweet at all. So, do sweetness inhibitors stop us from tasting D2O as sweet? Well, yes, yes they do, which is again kind of freaky, which really does suggest that it's our sweetness receptor that's being triggered here. But is there some other experiment that we could do that would maybe bolster this? Well, different animals have different taste receptors, that they taste D2O as sweet. Uh, at this point, we actually got in contact with an animal experimentation lab to, yes, see if mice could taste D2O as sweet. You see, mice have somewhat different taste receptors to our own, with one interesting difference being the sweetness inhibitor I used earlier, lactisol, doesn't actually work on mice. So, with mice with their different taste receptors, do they taste D2O as sweet? Well, how can you tell? Well, it turns out that if you give mice a choice of a 1% sugar solution 
which I reckoned was about how sweet D2O tasted, or regular water. The mice, <laughs> just like humans like their sweet things, mice like sweet water too. And just so we're clear of the format of the results that you're looking at here, you have water bottles and you just monitor how much the mice drink. Cool, so we'll try that with D2O. Now our initial experiments were fairly crude. We only measured the water consumption once per day, but stunningly, the mice show no preference for the D2O. It appears that they don't taste it as sweet, which is crazy if you think about it. Humans taste this as sweet, but mice don't. Then something strange happens. On the second day of the experiment, the mice start avoiding the D2O. I mean, can that be real? Then we got thinking, you know, your average mouse only weighs some 20-ish grams, and they can drink quite a lot per day, some 20% of their body weight in water per day, which means, you know, after a couple of days, that's enough to probably make these mice feel fairly bad. So maybe they just work out which bottle that was making them sick and avoid it. So we redesigned the experiment with <laughs> more sophisticated measuring devices such that we can swap the bottles day after day without the mice noticing. And the drinking bottles were much more sophisticated such that they could be measured many times per day. Actually, I'm being pretty generous when I say we here. This was almost entirely done by the Malatinska group at the IOCB, mostly Veronica. Well, as a blank, we have two water bottles filled with just regular distilled water. Obviously, the time when there's not much water consumption is when the mice are sleeping, but basically, you get one of these plots for every day of the experiment. So the experiment's going to go on for four days. You're going to see four plots like this. And sure, there are some paranoid fluctuations, what with mice being skittish little creatures and all. But this is what it looks like when both bottles just contain distilled water. So with the D2O, on the first day, yeah, there's not so much difference. But on subsequent days, they actually start avoiding the D2O. And I should stress that we're swapping the positions of these bottles on a day-by-day -day basis. So it's they can't just geographically relate which bottle they were drinking out of and avoid it. This means that they really have to be tasting the D2O here in order to avoid it. So D2O probably has some taste for mice. It's just not sweet. Now about this time, we were actually thinking of publishing this. There was just a uh, slight problem that none of this would really pass peer review. So we started collaborating with another group, uh, Amasha Niv, who ran a taste slash sensory lab. And not only did they replicate all of our results such that they would actually pass peer review, but also in collaboration with another lab in Germany under a Mike Behrens, made some cell line experiments that explicitly showed that it was the sweet receptor that was being triggered by the D2O. And recently, all of this got published in a paper in Nature Communications Biology. Now, this paper is almost unique of all of mine in that there really isn't a single result in this entire paper that was obtained by me. In fact, if you're being harshly honest and didn't know any of the history of this paper, my only direct contribution to this entire paper was that I distilled the water for the experiments. Something that I had long known wasn't actually necessary. You know, this was a super robust observation. It wasn't some subtle, subtle thing. You know, distilling the water really didn't make any difference. Um, so why do it? Well, peer review can be a fiddly and annoying process. And it was just one of the most obvious criticisms to get the paper rejected was, well, your water is dirty. Go back and do it again with clean water. So basically, I've done all of these distillations simply to avoid the hostage to fortune. 30 days of my life distilling bloody water for this paper. 30 tedious days of watching water distill. Each distillation required its own apparatus to be made. And how do I know it was 30 days? Well, I kept the empty bottles. Each one of those bottles represents a distillation kit that had to be made for either H2O or D2O. Flamed out and a distillation that takes about a day. In fact, let me, let me, let me just share with you a, a little anecdote here. If you've ever sat there and wondered, how did my life end up in this place? Well, for me, rock bottom, was on a second day when I was distilling water for the mice. Meanwhile, YouTube's on autoplay in the next room 
and a video comes up saying, yeah, Thunderfoot's just on YouTube for his ego, for the attention, for his narcissistic personality. Naturally, at the time, I had no other options but to change the playlist and continue. Because if you don't do the distillation properly, you might as well not do it at all. But there might have been a, a sudden outburst at about that time, you know, of, yeah, that's right, like the classical narcissistic personality traits, like distilling water for mice to drink. Death's too good for you. Okay, might have just gotten under my skin for a moment there. Each one of those lines there represents about a week of my life. Anyway, coming back into the light. Now it's actually in print. So what's the cause of all of this? Well, like I said earlier, H2O and D2O should have the same structure. In the classical world, in the quantum world, things get slightly different as you get lighter. I mean, you might remember our experiment where we drop a light and a heavy object on the moon and they fall at the same speed. True enough, in the classical world, not so much once you get into the realm of general relativity. Once you get into the super heavy objects that actually distort space-time, it's no longer really such a good approximation that all objects fall at the same speed under gravity. Which gives us the almost impossible task of explaining the quantum differences between H2O and D2O in less than five minutes without making it hand-wavingly vague. Well, lighter things tend to behave in a more wavy fashion than heavy things. So light is the ultimate light stuff, and so it's very wavy, whereas protons and neutrons are essentially entirely point source particle type things and entirely non-wavy. Electrons are wavy somewhere between these two. Okay, so if you get a piece of string and bind it at both ends and get it to vibrate, there are only certain standing waves that are stable. Now, we've not got a string in our case, but a potential well caused by the electrostatic attraction between the protons of the nucleus and the more wavy electrons. And those wavy electrons form standing waves in this potential well. These are the electron orbitals. Now, some of those are not just stable between a nucleus and electron, but two nuclei and some electrons. These are the chemical bonds, and they're what makes up you, me, them, and everything else. Yeah, in a very real sense, your body is full of these electron quantum effects, and there's really very little mysterious about them. You know, we normally just call them chemistry. Now, a chemical bond is some shared electrons and some nuclei, which fairly non-intuitively actually ends up behaving like a regular spring, a simple harmonic oscillator. Now, if you get a spring, in fact, if you get two springs, and you pull them back to the same degree. Fantastic, right, so here we've got two identical simple harmonic oscillators. So it's that if I pull them an identical amount out and let them go at the same time, you'll see that they vibrate so fairly convincingly at the same speed and with the same deflection. I'm gonna do that uh, uh, with a higher frame rate in a second. Oh, right, so now I'm gonna triple the mass of the guy at the bottom. The spring constant is, of course, exactly the same. Now I'm going to pull it back, exactly the same for both. So we're comparing the deflection of the black guy to the purple guy on top, okay? Now let's take a look at that at high frame rate as well. And what you find is the purple ball and the black ball oscillate with the same magnitude. The probability of finding them in any particular position is exactly the same for both of them. And this is what we mean when we say the structure doesn't depend on the mass. Well, at least in the classical world. The only difference is, is the lighter one explores those configurations more rapidly. Now, even in the quantum world, this is actually a reasonable approximation in that the OH bond does indeed vibrate significantly faster than the OD bond. Sadly, the approximation isn't perfect. You run into a subtlety that the potential well at the atomistic level is not quite a simple harmonic oscillator, combined with the fact that the zero point energy at this point depends on the mass at the ends of the spring there. The bottom line being there is a tiny difference between the structure of light and heavy water. And these minuscule differences are what we would call the quantum 
nuclear effect. And it's responsible for the really quite small thermodynamic differences between H2O and D2O, with light water freezing at 273 Kelvin, whilst it's about 277 for heavy water. And for boiling water, the difference is even smaller, with light water boiling at 373 Kelvin and heavy water at 374 Kelvin. There's also a tiny difference in pH, which I should stress is nothing to do with the difference in taste, in that when I was benchmarking the uh, sweet tastes, I also did the same for acids and alkalis. And yeah, it's nothing to do with the acid and alkalis. Likewise, when I did the vacuum distillation, I also showed that it was nothing to do with dissolved gases in the water. None of that makes any difference. So in terms of structure, um, let's take our numbers from earlier. A gram of water weighed 0.997 grams. The molecular weight of water is 18.015 atomic mass units. That means that there's 55 0.34 millimoles of water in that one milliliter. Our one milliliter of D2O weighed 1.107, with a molecular weight of just over 20 atomic mass units. So our one milliliter syringe here contains 55.27 millimoles of water. So these two syringes do indeed contain almost identical numbers of water molecules. They only vary by about one part in a thousand. But peculiarly, if you look in physical density, H2O is the less dense solution. If you take a look at number of molecules per unit volume, then D2O is actually the slightly less dense liquid. Yep, the structure of H2O and D2O are almost identical. But stunningly, you can actually taste those quantum nuclear effects. And even funkier, mice taste it differently than you do. In fact, the truth is that the D2O is the less quantum mechanical, more classical system. So in reality, it's more you can't taste the quantum nuclear effects in water, but you can taste their absence in D2O. So why sweet and not salty? Sadly, that is simply a question that is beyond our ability to answer at the moment. Sure, we have some hints that proteins like these taste receptors are a little more rigid in heavy water than in light water. But the simple truth is we only have inspired guesses as to what the three-dimensional structure of these taste proteins are actually like. An even less idea of how the subtle effects like the one part in a thousand change in the water molecule density between light and heavy water is likely to affect that. I guess in the meantime, we're going to have to content ourselves happy in the knowledge that quantum nuclear effects taste, well, kind of sweet. So if you enjoyed that, give it a thumbs up and share your amazing ability to not taste quantum nuclear effects with a friend or on Facebook or something. Many thanks to all those who have supported this channel over the years, which, yes, was actually acknowledged in the paper. And as ever, thanks for watching.